And these are fantastic four papers, so we'll not spend much time introducing. Uh, just wanted to say that the uh, I'll introduce briefly all four right now uh, of our panelists, and then uh, they will talk for about eight to 10 minutes, after which um, we'll have a discussion, uh, four of them and me, uh, about for 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll have questions uh, from our Zoom audience uh, first, and then from the in-person audience. Uh, uh, so very briefly, um, uh, the order of presenters, I'll just introduce very quickly uh, Tony Cho, who is joining us uh, from UC San Diego. He's a PhD student in the Department of Communication there. Stephen Barunda uh, who is joining us from UC Santa Barbara, PhD candidate in the Film and Media Studies Department. Uh, then we'll have uh, Ting Hao Zhou from UC Santa Barbara Film and Media Studies Department, and then uh, Feng Yi Yin from the Klein College of Media and Communication here at Temple University. Um, very excited about the paper, so without further ado, we'll go in the order as they're seated. Uh, so Tony, thank you. Um, yeah, okay, I'll start. Hello, my name is Tony Cho, and I'm a second year PhD student at UCSC's Communication and Science Studies program. Today, I will share with you some pre preliminary thoughts on the decommissioning of U.S. military bases and what may be forgotten in this process of land returns. U.S. military bases in Western academic literature have come to signify the imperial ambitions of the U.S., as well as the colonial and gender violence it presented in the form of camp town prostitution near such bases. Both um, show an uneven aspect of imperial occupation. However, base presence has largely been absent in theories of modernization of the South Korean state. For example, critical geographers like David Harvey have attributed the modernity of Korea to events like the 1997 Asian financial crisis, which refashioned state power through the introduction of global neoliberal institutions. Less critical progressive scholars have even attempted to call this modernization process a miracle and a model for other developing countries. However, in such accounts, there is often a complete omission of the fact that the South Korean state was already tethered to the US military even before its financial crisis. In this instance, two portrayals of Korea are being made through the use and unuse of US military bases, one which portrays a military logic through the figure of Koreans as victims of the Cold War, and the other which portrays a modern Korea becoming part of the global capitalist hegemony through the figure of the neoliberal subject. Both instances omit aspects of South Korean present or past. This gap is where I'd like to situate my own orientation towards understanding the decommissioning of bases and how they make productive the work of uneven development. To address this gap, I consider the ways in which military bases exist and are inhabited as forgotten places, with such inhabitation being understood through a series of abandonments which happen across this space. Abandonment, then, is the structure in which forgetfulness accumulates in such places. This is how I begin to understand the US Army's abandonment of military bases, which I hope to explore as I progress during my research. Um, today, I explore them by sharing four scenes of abandonment that illustrate the various findings that the decommissioning of military bases make possible and are made possible by. First, I look at the logic of occupation, which was justified in the name of American prestige and political economy. For military strategists in the 1940s, Korea was part of an American strategy to create a fully integrated monopoly trade sector called the Great Crescent, whose geography stretches from Japan to the borders of Iran. Thus, the securing of such interests would then mean the building of military infrastructures in South Korea would need to satisfy a favorable political economic logic for the US. Within this framework, the geographical and territorial concerns of occupation would need to be translated into financial concerns, which would result in the history of occupational costs incurred by the US government for its expenses in building, maintaining, and sustaining the military base bases. <clears throat> Here, I point to the way in which South Korea was intentionally represented as both liberal democracy and enemy territory for the US to maintain a favorable ideological and financial position. The ideological legitimation of occupancy would be informed by the notion that South Korea was a liberal democracy. However, the material construction of bases themselves required Korea to be considered an enemy territory. This is what would allow for the US to reject the pay-as-you-go plan ordinarily given to liberal democracies after receiving an exorbitant amount of advances from the Bank of Joseon, which would turn, in turn inflate the Korean economy and cheapen Korean labor. 
This asymmetry of financial obligation is forgotten from popular understandings of debt between South Korea and the US, as the inverted relation between debtor and debtee is normalized to the point that it is natural for the South Korean government to pay over 40 44% of the overall cost of having American troops on the peninsula. What is forgotten then is the dependency in which the US has always relied on Korea to keep its military occupation a financially viable project. This forgetting of financial dependency is coupled by the juridical expression inherent in the Status of Forces Agreement, or SOFA, in Korea. SOFA serves as the originary and primary legal imposition by the US military on the territory of South Korea, which only works by abandoning notions of friendship, alliance, and sovereignty that are often performed by the US and Korea. This is illustrated when juxtaposing the way US security experts and legal scholars describe SOFA versus the way it is enacted on the ground. On the one hand, it is claimed that SOFA signifies the friendship between two states as a bilateral agreement between two sovereigns. However, SOFA has always been invoked through a necropolitical logic, rendering Korean life killable for the sake of military occupation. This logic presents itself in the extraterritorial protection of American soldiers over the killing of two Korean school children and the military's abandonment of the military waste in these decommissioned bases. This suspended sovereignty requires the forgetting of Korea as friend or sovereign and instead as enemy territory, which is the foundational logic in which SOFA was founded on in the first place. The logic of occupation and this necropolitical exception are what accumulate in Camp Page today as it remains empty, flat, and undeveloped. It has now been 20 years since the initial agreement to have the land return, but it remains empty and suspended in place. This suspension is echoed in the poem by an anonymous activist who had contributed to an exhibition on Camp Page called Soil to Oil and Oil to Soil, or the last line of the poem reads, or has been returned but not returned. Here I want to think through this notion of the return but not returned, not only as a sentimental gesture for the condition in which bases stand, but the particular ways in which notions of sovereignty and territory can be articulated through this or notion of organized abandonment that is a return but not returned. The return but not return points to the way in which territories return, but sovereignty is not. Through SOFA and environmental policies like Kisei, the boundaries for acceptable levels of toxicity are not just based in concern for the Korean environment, but the US military's own national interest and security. This has been admitted by actors of SOFA who have limited the scope of environmental surveys on these returned lands in fears of potential security leaks which may occur from further investigation. This poem speaks to how a land that is never fully returned must rely on the forgetfulness of how the state is withdrawn from its own sovereignty in such an instance. While such suspension may lock development in place, this does not mean that imaginations for what happens after decommissioning are absent from discourse. Here I present a specific representation of Seoul designed by the Danish landscape architecture firm West 8, the firm selected by the Korean national government to re-signify the space that was formerly Yongsan Garrison. Titled The Park of Healing, uh, I am reminded of the latent territoriality that state-sponsored parks can serve in the formation of the state. This territoriality presents itself in inscribing of this imagined space as functioning as an act of healing, both on the ecology of the dense militarized metropole and the process of decolonization that the return of military base represents. Here, healing is represented in twofold. First, as the effort of perpetual modernization process Seoul must partake in in order to be acknowledged as a modern city. This is echoed through the way in which officials and press colloquially call this park the central park of Seoul, implying that mirroring of Western modernity will be healing enough. Secondly, and more interestingly, is the way in which the notion of a mystical and harmonious nature is attached to the process of healing itself. Here, healing is gestured through the echoing of a Korean adage, Samcheonli Gumsu Gangsan, or 3000 Ri, mountain and river range embroidered in gold. West State interprets this adage to suggest that it is a way that Korean people collectively perceive their physical world. However, tension exists within this interpretation of healing when understanding the political and cultural significance of the Korean adage. For one, this adage has historically represented a specific geography of the Korean peninsula which crosses the boundary between North and South Korea. This is also an adage used mostly during the time of Japanese colonial occupation, popularized by activist and scholar Nam Gong-ho who adapted this phrase to a song in the same name to be sung during the colonial occupation. Um, occupa occupation sorry. Looking back, West State's interpretation of a mythical nature that requires restoring in the Korean peninsula seems to be at odds with the expression of the struggle for national decolonization that the phrase Samcheonli Gumsu Gangsang had connoted throughout its history. Here we see that the appropriation of such phrases are an attempt to take a traumatic past and conceive it as a conflict-free present. In other words, it's a repair that forgets. 
These scenes of abandonment shed light on the different sort of gaps necessary to maintain American sovereignty in South Korea. Perhaps it will be in remembering such abandonments which may gesture toward a different sort of return than the one that is currently present in the decommissioning of U.S. bases. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for, for being here with us today for this second panel. Um, so I'll go ahead and dive right in. So my, the title of my talk is Media Laboratories, Trinity, the Dolorosa Basin Downwinders, and the Politics of Non-Life Itself in the Chihuahuan Desert. On July 16, 1945, the US government detonated the world's first atomic weapon in the landscapes of the Chihuahuan Desert in southern New Mexico at the site codenamed Trinity. Contrary to public perception, when the Manhattan Project detonated the world's first atomic we weapon at the Trinity site, those within the military industrial complex privy to the specifics of atomic science keenly understood at least some of the dangers to which they were going to expose local communities when they detonated Gadget, the plutonium implosion device. Far from being an empty region, 40,000 people resided in just the surrounding four uh, counties and under half a million in all of New Mexico at the time of the blast. So an aerial view of the blast afterwards. Closer to a million people were easily within the surrounding areas of Trinity, if we include El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. Urban cities comprised mainly of indigenous, Mexican, Chicanx communities, populations that have often been uh, racialized as mixed others in the US context. From a deeper historical perspective, New Mexico has been the most populated region, had been the most populated region to come under jurisdiction, US jurisdiction following the Mexican-American War. With substantial numbers of indigenous communities, and the largest number of Mexican citizens subsumed into the US by any region that had previously been part of Mexico. For decades, both the region's uh, racial and linguistic compositions were central concerns for US lawmakers in their opposition to statehood, for instance, for New Mexico. The first language uh, for many was either Spanish or an indigenous language in the region. Many indigenous communities in the region were and still are multilingual and spoke or speak Spanish as a lingua franca. In 1902, prior to New Mexico's, uh, New Mexico's statehood, U.S. Senator Albert J. Beveridge from Indiana argued that the region itself was composed of this, quote, mass of people unlike us in race, language, and social customs, and was commonly held that the region required more Anglo populations, cultural practices, and English speakers before statehood could be granted. For more than a half century, lawmakers in the U.S. government and U.S. print media had argued that, according to Laura Gomez, uh, mestizo Mexicans and Indians were too wild and irresponsible, end quote, to be the predominant populace of a U.S. state. These accounts of coloniality make it unsurprising that the weapon at Trinity was identical uh, to the bomb that the military later used in Nagasaki, and that prior to the implosion at Trinity, famed physicist Enrico Fermi even joked that the weapon could set fire to the air, but, quote, only over uh, New Mexico, end quote. The disregard held for the region by Fermi, and this exchange was shared elsewhere within the Manhattan Project. Historian Alex Wellerstein has documented, documented how the Army preemptively prepared for alternative statements for the press based on the variety of possible outcomes of the atomic blasted Trinity, even potentially genocidal ones. After Trinity, the Army released what they thought was the most appropriate option of these four statements. They published in local newspapers that the explosion was the result of the unintentional detonation of explosive and pyrotechnics. To justify this deception, a memo, likely penned by General Les Leslie Groves, the director of the Manhattan Project, described New Mexico and its Chihuahuan Desert as just a big place, quote, uh, with few people living in it, end quote. U.S. government officials did not inform the predominantly indigenous and Chicanx Nuevo uh, Mexicano local inhabitants about the atomic blast or its radioactivity, and the statements of people like Groves, like, uh, signify, excuse me, the commencement of the erasure of local communities of color in the aftermath of the atomic bomb. So in my short paper, I sought to consider the role of colonial violences, sensing media, and their aesthetic inscription processes, as I'll begin this, to discuss here for just a mo moment, um, and the making of the desert environment itself during this event via my concept of media laboratories. So I've recently begun, and this is a, sort of the new aspect of the research that I'm excited to think with you all through today. So I've recently, recently begun to research how technocrats from the Manhattan Project used various classes of film strips to aestheticize, sense, record, and quantify the radiation from the atomic implosion in the desert. 
Developed and processed film that has been previously exposed to radiation will exhibit a darkened density. And scientists used this uh, darkening to, object to objectively, quote unquote, measure the gamma and x-ray radiation levels in the Chihuahuan Desert that resulted from the blast. Scientists and military personnel both mailed film strips around the region and possessed their own film badges at Trinity. While the history of the atomic films that followed have been more extensively explored by uh, film and media scholars, in contrast, little has been said about film as a sensing media that scientific experts deployed at, atomic, uh, at some of these atomic blast sites, including Trinity, and the role of this sensing media whose inscriptions function as a very sort, uh, different sort of filmic hieroglyphic. Atomic modernity required laboratories, not just of science, but also desert ecology, uh, ecologies, the human and non-human bodies in these ecologies, and required media to construct and reconstruct hierarchies of race, epistemes, matter, threshold limits, and life. In part, due to increased concerns from the public and increased organizing capacities of the Tolerosa Basin downwinders, locals impacted by cancers and other health, uh, health maladies because of radioactive slow violence from Trinity, the National Cancer Institute released a study in 2020 that they described as the most comprehensive about Trinity. Led by Dr. Stephen Simon, a former scientist at the Los Alamos Laboratory, this study generally minimized the impacts of the atomic blast. One part of the study concluded that the doses received from Trinity by external irradiation were not very large, except in limited areas immediately downwind of the detonation site. And the study relied extensively on these film strips that I've been discussing to justify these results, despite the ways in which the film strips have proven to be, um, at best, unreliable due to environmental factors like weather and the uncertainty around how they were even deployed. So I sought to begin to conceptualize uh, this concept of the media laboratories, plural, as such laboratories are always emerging, techno-scientific ontologies, building on recent scholarship on saturation in environmental media studies by Melody Jew, um, and Rafiko Ruiz, who posits starting with environments as ontologically dense situations rather than distinct objects, elements, or types. Media laboratories as a heuristic gesture uh, towards the importance for media scholars to explore Trinity as a past-present moment of, of still un unfolding slow violence, and to not just focus on the discrete sensing media, tools of calculation and measurement deployed in the Chihuahuan Desert. Rather, I argue that the concept of media laboratories puts forward a media theory that attends to this atomic past present as a situation where colonial histories, media aesthetics, and discourses of science are entwined, and human and non-human body bodies find themselves sensing, radiating, living, and dying in the desert milieu. As a concept, media laboratories then is critical of conventional ideas of both the scientific laboratory and the desert as contained and isolated. The concept experimentally and justly orients our, our attention to how According to Bhaskar Sarkar, we as media uh, scholars, rather than, quote, insisting on an epistemological separation between media and non-media realms, we need to recognize that each permeates the other thoroughly. Media laboratories can help us think about energy, specifically atomic energy and media infrastructures in today's world beyond the, per, uh, the standard discourses put out by nuclear corporatists at places like Los Alamos National Laboratory and push us towards a media studies grounded in environmental justice. Indeed, local bodies in desert environments experienced slow radioactive mediations and mutations becoming environmental media. The Tularosa Basin downwinders, um, again, those locals impacted in the area, um, have sought recognition in the necessary reparations for harm done. Um, thank you. And they've uh, crafted digitized community archives of rural testimonies and histories. For instance, an 11-year-old boy at the time of the atomic blast uh, local Henry Herrera remembers watching a cloud of dirt, smoke, and debris for hours as it traveled uh, to the northeast towards Capitan, Ruidoso, Ondo, and Roswell. Eventually, the smoke then turned towards his own town of Dolorosa, a town that neighbors my abuelo's own town, hometown of uh, Almogordo. Herrera then ran inside to tell his mother in Spanish, aquí viene la bola atrás, as radioactive dirt, smoke, and debris fell onto his family's clothes, roof, and even their water cistern. Both Herrera and many in my own family are counted amongst the, the Tolerosa Basin downwinders. Uh, my grandfather, a child at the time of the blast, uh, passed away in his 50s from a bizarre cancer. In Herrera's accounts, some of the ways that locals sensed and made sense of the desert and its radioactive attributes after Trinity become clear. They included, but were not limited to, physical sensorial perceptions through the bodies, through the body and the sensing of time, place, and histories that counter those official narratives about an atomic tests that occurred in an imagined isolated desert. 
In the Rancierian sense, political moments are not those forms of bureaucratic governmental functioning, but instead those breaks in the sensible, in the natural order of domination by those who have no part. Scientists working on Trinity large, have largely sustained regimes and ways of sensing that furthered uh, atomic modernity's aims to deem certain bodies and spaces as waste, pushing local communities in southern New Mexico facing cancers and other health issues towards the realm of death, the realm of the non-living. Media laboratories are multiple, contested, and also composed of the politics of non-life attempts uh, from those who have no part to inject their mediated corporeal accounts and family stories into official histories that have thus far been dominated by uh, contradictory states' accounts, uh, contradictory state accounts of radial instruments of both uncertainty and precision when it comes to quantifying uh, rontogens in the desert. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I think before my presentation, I just want to just say thank you to the uh, organizing committee of the symposium, especially to Azure, to Anastasia, just being there, super patient, and just you know responding, coordinating. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Rahul, and also my fellow panelists being the reader of my, uh, my this, uh, this paper. I really appreciate the time and labor you put into um, doing that. So um, I'm very humbled to share this short paper with you all, which is really um, a preliminary study of hopefully a dissertation chapter um, that examines the entangled relationship among the siting of critical inf information infrastructure like data centers, um, the formation of geological landscape, and the geopolitical frictions between different actors or agencies uh, situated in the context of Southwest China. So I will dive right in. Um, so when media scholars Jennifer Holt and Patrick Vondrell ask where the internet lives, they urge media scholars to, quote, understand the immaterial support systems for data storage and data transmission, or physical networks of digital media distribution, and to also see the standards and protocols, affordances, and constraints built into these networks. What they propose is essentially a methodology of looking at critical media infrastructure with a strong awareness that the shown parts are only the shadow over the hidden hole that is possibly filled with systematic complications, environmental conflicts, political frictions, and ideological paradoxes. So following Holt and Von der Rohe, I employ the methodology of seeing the hidden uh, structure in this paper to examine the material and spatial configuration of a cluster of data centers planned and built in Guian New Area, a state-sanctioned experimental um, city of uh, uh, experimental area for big data and digital economy. Uh, situated on the highland region near Guiyang, the capital city of Guizhou province in southwest China. Guian serves as a logistic city, to borrow critical logistics scholar Deborah Cohen's term here, um, that hosts uh, critical infrastructures of data storage and information processing, electronics production, and high-tech education. It's not only the home to the new warehouse of um, tech company Apple's data, but also the data centers of the domestic tech giants like Huawei, Tencent, and uh, the Foxconn's Green Industrial Park, and the college town of Guizhou Higher Education. So um, beside the besides the physical structures and the spatial relationships of these data centers, I also delve deep into the geopolitical, uh, uh, geological and political context in which um, the critical information infrastructure is imagined, designed, and built. I think um, Holt and von der Rau's approach speaks to a rather general um, American or Swedish specific category. Uh, hence, it's inadequate to fully address the issues and concerns uh, raised in the process of planning, building, and regulating um, media infrastructures in a non-Western context. So the Trans-Pacific Tunnel economic installation and collaboration we are seeing in Gui and now demands a localizing framework that could d deal with a new model of infrastructural planning. So in this case, the central questions of this paper are attending to the socioeconomic, political, 
uh, sorry about that. Yeah, um, uh, uh, political environmental specificities of the newborn city, Guian, um, and the policy background of the nation state. Uh, so not content with only asking where the internet lives, I'm instead wondering where the internet and China is allowed to live. Um, how the Chinese internet or data network actually looks like. What elements constitute the environmental affordances and limitations for the data center settlement. So reading across national policies and corporate strategies, particularly from Apple, Tencent, and Huawei, I argue that landing the cloud in local places like Guian is a collusion project of two expansionist uh, forces. The expansion of the economic nationalist control from the political center of the nation state to its periphery and the expansion of the big tech colonialism into the hidden land of the global media economy. Um, State propaganda and media, like the series I'm examining in the paper, China Reinvents Itself, enable me to see that the cluster of information infrastructures is shaped by a particular kind of ideal that associate data security with a form of grounding. This grounding takes a political form and a, uh, and a geological form. On the one hand, China's economic nationalism is often manifested as uh, various intensive forms of so societal control aiming to create an image of national strength and security. Data security uh, uh, makes essential contributions, contributions to this kind of image, especially in the current digital age, being data is secure in the government's hand. On the other hand, Guian proffers particular environmental conditions and geological grounds upon which the data center is being constructed. For example, natural caves and underground we see here, um, uh, uh, caverns are considered as stable, ready-made bunkers that can perfectly host the data center with their natural air conditioning system. Um, so my attention to the dependent relationship between geology and media infrastructures aligns with the current material turn in media theory, attempting to articulate the process of grounding, sourcing, filling, and maintaining the physical site and operation of data storage and computing. Proposed by media archeologist Yusi Parika as a geology of media at first, this methodology of probing into the material structure of media is later rephrased by um, environmental media theorist Yuriko Furuhata as media geology, which binds together not only the media object and its geological sources, but more importantly, the mediation process, uh, process and geophysical imaginaries. In conceptualizing the archipelago as a geologically mediated form of storage media that, quote, keeps earthly records of deep time, Furuhata diagnoses and embraces a humanist tendency to explain natural forms and forces in technological and anthropocentric metaphors. However, um, the media geological habit of conceiving any kind of geological formation as a storage or archival medium risks homogenizing the diversified histories and forms of geological development. It shapes a perceptual bias that often associates the grounding flatland for anthropogenic activities with the idea of durability, steadiness, and immovability, and hence conceives it as an ideal for the settler um, colonial and econo uh, econ economy and politics. If we look deeply into the material and formal properties of the karst landscapes instead, we see that it poses challenges to this way of conceptualizing the land. With its sinking um, substances, oh yeah, um, with its sinking substances and rock solution, the karst topography instead delineates a mountainous milieu with magnificent bio biodiversity, um, complex hydrological relationships and ecosystems, and consequ uh, consequently scarce farmlands. It thus demands a local based. Um, reori or reorientation in the media geological thinking. 
The media questions we ask should gesture towards the possibility of an anonymous, local, and geologically specific process of mediation. So how do we um, imagine the cards formation as an unstable storage, like cash or an unstorage medium? Is that what form of temporality and spatiality does it register? What conflicts does it create with media infrastructures that rely on particular material foundations and spatial imaginaries? And what different modes of archival reading and understanding does the cards landscape provoke for historical writings and society? critiques. So in the, the other half of my paper, I'm actually uh, uh, trying to answer this question looking at um, uh, independent artistic documentary caches from the landscape, which weave together life and voice of the male people, the major ethnic minority group living in Guizhou. Um, um, but I would like to talk about it more in the Q&A section or after. The yeah, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Yin Feng Yi. I'm a second year doctoral student from um, Media and Communication Dep uh, Department at Temple University. My presentation today is about layered environmental discourses, media representations of transnational extractivism in Zimbabwe. Uh, the relations between China and Zimbabwe started uh, during the Zimbabwe Independence War and developed um, under the Look East policy launched by the former President Mugabe and strengthened um, when the current President Munangagwa took over the government um, and uh, promised a safe investment environment for investors. In 2020, when I, works for, uh, when I worked for UNESCO uh, Southern African Region Office, um, I did media monitoring and I discovered that the increasing number of Chinese extractive projects created controversies over environment and uh, nano disputes. So, uh, and also drew uh, a lot of me local media attention. So my interest in, in this project started then, and I developed this uh, project um, this semester, um, to understand how the uh, Zimbabwe mainstream media shape people's environmental consciousness and, uh, the, uh, and their perception of the transnational extractivism. I proposed the following three research questions. Uh, what environmental discourses are constructed in Zimbabwean media, uh, mainstream media, and what are the implications to uh, power relations at um, local, regional, and global levels? And what characteristics of Zimbabwean media systems are uh, reflected in these uh, discourses? Um, to address these uh, research questions, I draw literature from three streams of scholarships. The first one, uh, I think this phenomenon is uh, very closely so associated with global extractivism, which refers to extraction of natural resources to promote economic growth in a transnational scale, which uh, results in subordination of a, net of a nation to a transnational capital. Extractivism is not only a practice, but also a mindset on how we position ourselves to the environment and uh, the and other uh, humans. Um, to identify environmental discourses, um, I rely on the book from Dreisig um, on environmental discourses. He identifies th uh, four shared ways of understanding uh, the environment. I will uh, talk a little bit more about the fir first two. So very briefly, Promethean discourses um, believe that the Earth is unlimited. Um, discourse of limits and survival uh, see the expansion of uh, e economy and the population, population growth uh, will eventually exceed the carrying capacity of the earth. Um, third, Zimbabwe media systems um, show the high parallelism between media and the political parties. For instance, uh, the state-controlled media is believed to uh, associate with the NUPF, which is the ruling party, and the private media is more close to the opposition party, Triple uh, C. And also, the media system show a low journalistic professionalism and a high uh, degree of state intervention to silence, uh, to silence the dissent to the ruling power. 
um, grounded in these three uh, streams of scholarship, I conducted a critical discourse analysis on the media uh, report um, about Chinese extractive uh, projects in Zimbabwe. Um, I selected four media outlets, two are from uh, to a state-controlled media, the Herald and the Chronic, Chronicle, and to um, um, private media, Newsday and Blow Your 24 News. And uh, the four, uh, two of them based in the capital city, Harare, and the two based in the second largest city in southern part of Zimbabwe, which is Blau Oil. So the media have the national and also uh, regional focus. The time period I choose from January to December 2021, because um, the prominent controversies happened during this period. After preliminary reading, I, ad I identified uh, three themes. Uh, first, um, in state-controlled media, Promethean discourses hold a dominant position. Uh, so, uh, first, for, for uh, sorry, for example, um, the media constructs the promise of unlimited natural resources to Zimbabwe's na uh, nation's um, ambitious economic growth. Also, the, there's um, there's an absence of environmental concerns, which align with one assumption of per uh, Promethean. Uh, discourse is that uh, only economic rational actors are recognized as agents and their instrumental motivations dominant the um, extractive practices. Also, state cultural media that construct Chinese transnational extractivism as socially and environmentally responsible and as a partner in, really, in harmony with the Zimbabwe national long-term development strategy. In private media, um, uh, private media m mainly focused on criticisms to Chinese mining activities from multiple actors um, at a local level, uh, reflecting the competing and coexisting Promethean limits and environmental justice discourses. The discourse of environmentalists um, again, who, uh, who are against the uh, Chinese mining activities in Huangi National Park um, reflect uh, 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 Acknowledge the limits, uh, the limited um, carrying capacity of ecosystem, uh, since they concern about the uh, damage the many activity can cause to national parks and uh, wildlife. Uh, tourism agents um, hold a uh, promising discourse, since um, nature is viewed as um, an instrumental tool for uh, tourism sector to reach uh, economic ends. Um, the coverage on the resistance from local villagers reflect uh, discourse of justice. Um, for instance, news uh, attributes the dispute to a lack of culture-centered participatory communication. Since uh, the Chinese uh, mining companies and the Zimbabwe government or the MPF as ruling party didn't get consent from the local villagers and also ign ignored the alternative meaning of development and an end. Um, also, private media re represent uh, transnational extractivism as an organized crime, as I just mentioned, with collaboration between the um, transnational business and also the uh, Zimbabwe national government. Uh, with a human face, because the language used in private media tried to uh, transform this abstract notion of extractivism, transna transnational extractivism, and uh, its complex mechanisms behind it into a human character with a Chinese face. Um, based on those themes, we can see that media polarization manifested in politicized environmental reporting with an elite-centric and urban-centric journalistic practice. Um, since, mo since most of the voices um, represented in the news are from the elites, uh, are the elites from the government, from companies, from civil society and uh, local authorities, the, the voices of uh, the majority of affected villagers are mostly absent. Yeah, so those um, themes are my preliminary findings. Yep, thank you. So I must uh, thank the organizers, um, Esther, Jing, Aisha, for uh, uh, 
uh, inviting you to uh, respond to this panel, which I think is a great panel. Also, uh, for the naming this panel as Global Media Territories, because I think it's a remarkable um, and very astute way of framing this panel. Um, I had a chance to um, read the papers as well, and the presentations were fabulous, and I thought the papers were written also uh, really well. Uh, I say that it's a great name for the panel, too, because I think all these papers so well explain this relationship between media and territories and media and land. Uh, so it's um, uh, media in a way which inscribes uh, as film strips um, radioactivity in land, the land for landing the cloud, as Ting Hao puts it, the highlands, the caste landscape for the data center, land for lithium and granite mining and Fungi's work. And um, land was once occupied by military bases that is going through an elongated process of decommissioning, as, as Tony uh, puts it. So uh, these are remarkable sets of papers just to think through that relationship between media and land, and more specifically, uh, the way in which mediation not only represents the land, but media and land are sort of co-constituted in this way of uh, how important land is for media infrastructure development, but also uh, the mining is for running photovoltaic cells and other media um, elements. So. Um, but, but it's important to mark that it's land, but also land as territory. And I think one of the questions that I have, because there's a lot of, lot of the papers are about occupation of land. That's where I think territory is so important. And um, it's occupation of land in a way sometimes by external powers, but sometimes um, by internal state governments and transnational corporate regimes. So I was curious, and this is something that uh, I have often been asked to as to whether in this way of thinking about media and territory in the very different papers that you have, um, so, and this is a more general question, and then I'll very quickly go through each paper and ask a specific question, but I want you to think about that general question and also then the specific question. So the general question that I have uh, for all of you in a way is in this relationship, in thinking about occupation, in thinking about territory in your papers, how do you see the difference between sovereignty and autonomy, and the sort of the similarity of self-governance in both the words, but the emphasis on power being different in both these terms. And I want you to think about it both in terms of how you see the occupations of these different uh, territories or media territories, and how you see in terms of what kind of control and agency the local communities um, want to have in your you know, research on these things. So I'll very, so this is the general question, and very specifically, because each of these papers is so remarkable, I did want to say something more specific. So um, Stephen, uh, and I'll go in a different order, but uh, feel free. So Stephen, I think it was very poetic and moving, and that partly autoethnographic notes in your paper are, 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 are remarkable. I think the way you call these, the Trinity tests is not atomic tests, but atomic attacks is a powerful uh, rejoinder in some ways. I, I was. The, the way you describe film as a sensing media is fabulous, mm -hmm. but it seems towards the end of the paper, you're very interested in radioactive embodiment. Mm -hmm. uh, you're interested in how, in some ways, as you say, the Tularosa Basin downwinders, how their bodies are media as well. In a way, and you phrase it beautifully when you say uh, that what you're interested in tracing are these interactions of radiations, bodies, and desert ecologies. So how does one do that is the question in some ways. And because I ask this because, you know, this notion of body as media is particularly important. Uh, that bodies and media, uh, the difference in a way is that each human body and the way it perceives radiation is different. Uh, it has, each body has a different you know expression, <laughs> yeah, has a different expression, has a different sensitivity. Mm -hmm has a different threshold. Uh, but media sometimes as technologies can be very standardized, they act as standards. Yeah. So how does one account for that differential? Uh, so I was interested and I would love to hear more. Uh, you know, that was a superb paper and the way you think through this, spe specifically how you think about geology and grounds, working through the scholarship from Parika to Furuhada. Uh, I, it was I, I particularly um, found the way you're thinking about cache to be very interesting in thinking about the stability and instability and how indigenous local communities are thinking about the landscape and how the, the, the state government is thinking about uh, that landscape. But I was particularly interested in the way you use cache, and I think it's very imaginative to think that way, as cache being um, a different form of memory than the sort of 
uh, promise of the permanent memory of sorts in the cloud. But I'm, I still want to push a little on your use of cache, and, and you said you will talk about the film as well, which is called mm -hmm. Caches from the Landscape. Because cache is also, as you talked about logistics today, mm -hmm. in this moment of logistics where terms like optimization are const constantly being floated, cache also becomes this move away from cloud computing towards fog and mist computing, or deep mm -hmm. edge computing today, where you know there's a way in which the cache is being told to be closer now, not mm -hmm. in the cloud, but closer to the 5G cell tower where they'll store that cache. So I think the cache has a lot of redeeming qualities in some ways too, but at the same time, it's also operationalized today as you know something which is more optimized computing. Mm -hmm. So I would still push a little as to how mm -hmm. uh, there needs to be some caveats. So anyway, I'm, yeah. I'm interested more, and I'm sure the audience is also very interested in listening to you more about, about cache yeah. and how you're thinking through that. Um, from the other side, remarkable paper and the way you think about uh, the difference between how the state media in Zimbabwe covers it, uh, covers the, the transnational mining, um, and how the private uh, pr private ownership, so ownership matters how the private papers um, uh, cover it, uh, and that kind of framing. Uh, having done some work in Zambia, a neighboring country, again in that same coverage, I was very, very interested I do think that as much as you, um, your analysis of the discourse is superb, I think, the environmental discourse aspects are superb, but I think it could do more as you um, extend the paper in thinking about the relationship between materiality and discourse, mm -hmm. particularly in the way you're thinking about lithium or granite mining and the material practices uh, that are involved in them could be a bit more, and I was very interested if you can find ways in, to think about, you know, what is involved in the mining itself. For example, lithium mining is very different from petroleum, uh, you know, crude oil extraction or uranium mining. It doesn't leave tailing ponds, but sometimes it has issues of water scarcity. I mean, it requires a lot of water. Um, so I was interested what the specifics of that mining process, because you do such a good job of thinking through journalistic practice and the environmental discourse. But I think, in some ways, the material practice of mining and the discourse about it, those two, that connection, it would be great to hear more. Um, and Tony, I mean, the, super, again, like, uh, really interested in how you, and, you know, I, I thought of the question of sovereignty, thinking about your paper, and you put it so beautifully, uh, saying the phrase, return but no return, in the way these bases are being returned, but are they really being returned? in terms of, and you said this decoupling of the sense of territory from that of sovereignty, very beautiful phrasing and very moving, but also very important phrasing. I was curious um, if the term, which I didn't find that much, uh, but the term r ruins or, or the term ruination, and there's some recent work by Annenberg's own uh, Juan Yamas Rodriguez on ruinous speculation, but some uh, earlier work by Ann Stoller on ruination as well, and the way um, Stoller is thinking through the um, the imperial, how the imperial power occupies the present. I think the book is Imperial Debris. So I was interested in how, in, in thinking through such complicated issues of land, memory, and forgetting, how the term ruination can play into your conceptualization. So these are, of course, brilliant papers, and they put together, I think, a way of thinking about extraction, occupation, territory source, and of course, media so, so very beautifully. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to hear a little bit from each of you. Thank you. Anyway, uh, you know, maybe, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I can, I can um, maybe start off the, the conversation. Thank you, Rahul, for those um, really astute questions and, and especially uh, excited to sort of hear your thoughts. Um, somebody who thinks a lot about radioactive bodies and, and so on um, and, and those nuances. So, so yeah, I think for me, something that I'm interested in trying to think about is this concept of a voice landing um, put out by um, by Tracy Voyles in terms of the ways in which um, we cannot clearly sort of differentiate the the um, uh, regions and bodies deemed as wasteland. Like it, it's a process that happens simultaneously. And I think for me, that's kind of why I started with the with the historical in terms of thinking about. Uh, these desert regions in the in the U.S. Southwest very broadly, but New Mexico as in particular, as regions that have there have been multiple sort of um, 
attempts to wasteland the region, right? Mm -hmm. So we can start with, um, of course, the, the Spanish conquest, and then we have to, and then, but also too, to understand the ways in which the U.S. moves into the region. We have to understand how even the Mexican government views these regions as wastelands, as lands um, overrun with indigenous communities, um, as regions that must now be tamed, right, and made and made civil, and these sorts of things. Um, so that's one way in which sort of like the sovereign seems to insert itself. And so these um, atomic histories then are, you know, they, they're layered histories that um, that are in many ways like a, th a third form of colonialism, something like this in the region. Um, in terms of your question, Rahul, about um, radioactive embodiment, I think that's something that I'm still um, thinking through a lot with some of uh, the community partners that I've been able to develop in the region. But there seems to me a, a way in which um, attempts to um, create archives around oral histories, around particular interactions with the radiation are important and understanding that these are all vastly different stories. There might be accounts um, such as in my family's account of people with horrendous cancers. There might be other, there are accounts from other families um, of ways in which uh, there may, may not have been in effect, uh, but perhaps a, a family member or a loved one was lost, these sorts of things. Um, so yeah, understanding that radioactivity impacts bodies differently over different temporal scales, um, that's something that I'm definitely thinking through as well. Um, and the ways in which these um, digital archives are able to then create um, you know, stronger publics, because the downwinders themselves that I was, I was speaking to at the end, they've sort of been able to, to really organize and um, sort of strengthen their efforts over the past uh, 30 years or so. Um, because something that I didn't really clearly articulate uh, either in the paper or in my discussion today is the ways in which they're trying to basically um, be recognized legally in the U.S. by RICA, the, Radio uh, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, that has been very eager to recognize, um, for instance, Nevada downwinders, uh, downwinders in other parts of the U.S. Um, that are, are that are uh, oftentimes in regions that do not look like New Mexico, which again is, is a largely um, a state composed of communities of color and so on. So those are just some of my initial like ruminations on your questions. I, I can try to answer. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think um, I, I, I indebted this concept definitely from the artist um, writing on um, cash is from the landscape, the concept of cash itself is being, I think, a very interesting and significant concept um, to think about, um, for me, especially in the context of my proposed dissertation, to think about how media concepts and theory could be reimagined or re-articulated um, in um, local areas, per se, or in um, uh, the rural areas or, you know, the hidden places of the global media economy. Mm -hmm. So that's a larger project I'm trying to do, which should use different kinds of media concepts that are not, you know, that taken for granted, like transmission, you know, uh, distribution, um, archive recording per se, but to use this more specific and, and it's also like so you know, entangled in our lives, but are just being ignored um, to frame what I'm, different sites I'm looking at. So cash is being this one concept that I want to think with um, this site, a specific site. And for me, I think cash is about um, proximity, accessibility, and efficiency. Um, mm. So um, I think that could kind of kind of answer your question about um, sovereignty and autonomy by asking then if cash if, if cash is about you know proximity and, and accessibility then who 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 are closer to those lands and resources and who have access to those lands and resources and who determine um, the distribution of of the spatial the spaces and um, and the resources as well, um, so I think those are in important questions to ask. And you you pinpoint some of the very interesting um, point of the idea of cash is that you know there's some kind of utopian ideal around cash as well, which is actually I think it's very interesting. And there's some political significance of cash as well, right? Um, being 
I think we are at an age that is being oriented from, you know, focus on, you know, maybe focusing on permanent memory to actually um, prioritizing caches, this kind of random, close, quick memory. Um, so for me, I think I want to use cache to think about digital economy and also a mode of being and subjectivity in, in digital economy as well. Um, so I think cache is being both material and virtual. Um, I mean, ontologically, it's both material and virtual as well. Um, so, so yeah, I, thank you for the question. It just helped me to brainstorm how I can, you know, multi, multiple the use of cash. That's fascinating mode yeah. you know, of subjectivity mm -hmm. and material. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I can go, I guess. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. And I think your general question about <laughs> sovereignty and autonomy is probably where my project is going in terms of like, you know, if not sovereignty, then can there be autonomy in these spaces? What does that look like? What do people want? And that's one of the things that, you know, I'm in my second year as a PhD, I'm, I, and I'm planning to go out in the field and work with kind of like the environmental activists and the peace activists who've been kind of trying to basically stop any sort of development from happening in these spaces because once the US leaves, it's really hard for them to be held accountable. So, um, but one of the things that people have trouble discussing is then, okay, if it's not gonna be a national park, if it's not gonna be commercial real estate, what is it gonna be? <laughs> and I, I think that gets back to your question of like autonomy. If not sovereignty, then what can we autonomously do in this space to kind of, you know, get, get another sense of return? And I really, you know, I really appreciate you pointing out this idea of ruination um, and ruins and, you know, the Imperial Debris book. I definitely, you know, that is a inspiring read for me as well. And I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about that whole volume was the fact that you know, ruination, ideas about ruination and rot, they're like active. And it's definitely, you know, a case here in South Korea as well where it's not just ruins, it's the continual process of ruination. And that is what actually is allowing for kind of the state to kind of pull off this idea of like, oh, we're fully decolonized now. Because um, one of the things that's happening now is because of the level of toxicity in the land, um, it's actually cheaper to build a national park because because of various environmental codes. You actually, the cleanup process is a lot cheaper for a national park than it is for commercial real estate development. So what's happening now is like the state is taking advantage of the toxicity to kind of be like, okay, we'll make a national park and then we'll say we're fully decolonized, even though the US military is still building other bases within the peninsula. Mm -hmm. So this is, yeah, and this is, and, you know, like the, I think about 40 to 30 bases have been, you know, agreed upon to be returned since the early 2000s, but um, they're also building really big ones closer to China. Yeah, the, the geopolitics has changed a little bit. Yes. Which has shifted, as you mentioned in your paper. Thank you for the question. Uh, to answer your first question, um, like as you see in my in the project, I just presented um, the transnational and the national uh, bureaucratic and economic systems created a situation some scholars call it, like internal con colonialism, which mm -hmm. indicates that uh, uh, the, per the periphery regions or communities within a nation state um, be ex be excluded from the political participation and the and, and the decision making, so that that sounds depressing. And uh, uh, um, from the um, literature I read about the extractivism in Latin America context, there are like transmogul re resistance movement organized uh, from uh, uh, organized by the subaltern uh, communities. Um, so I, I don't know much about uh, in the Zimbabwe context or in the South African region, re region uh, whether there's like transnational resistance movement to get to against this type of um, uh, try to like um, resist this situation of internal colonialism. Uh, yes, that's that, that, yeah. That's the first question. Second one. Uh, to be honest, I haven't thought about uh, materiality yet. Earlier I was talking to him and he, uh, we were talking about his materiality. It's something I can look for, uh, I can like, um, 
look for, uh, forward later in my uh, study. But, um, but I do think about there's some dimension of materiality I can still talk about from, from what I just presented. For, for instance, like this uh, meaning of land, what does it mean? Uh, so like, um, we can see that there's hegemonic um, meaning from development agents or the uh, government and the transnational capital, what does development mean and what land mean? It's, it's like uh, to extract natural resources to, uh, for economic growth. But for the local communities, land, which can mean like their ancestors rest and uh, their some spirits rest. So um, you can see that very, the, the, the alternative meaning of what does mean by land and, uh, and, and development. And, and the second, I think, materiality, um, in the end, when I talk about how the Zimbabwe media systems show this kind of elite and uh, urban-centric, um, that is a discourse constructed, but also it reflects the materiality of the Zimbabwe media system, which is that some, some media outlets, they don't have enough vehicles or they don't have, uh, mm. to go to the rural areas or mm. they can pay enough to the journalists to, yeah. um, to interview. So I feel this is another uh, dimension I can Absolutely. See. And I think the materiality of journalistic practices mm. is very central to the work, and I really appreciated that. Yeah, I think this internal discussion should be over, but I also wanted to ask if there are questions from Zoom, I guess, which... Would, yeah. One second. One second. Um, we have two questions. Uh, one from Brian Kendai. Uh, question to Zoo: Do data centers have a lifespan? Can we project or predict a trajectory of having more data centers in specific parts of China or elsewhere in the world? Um, should I repeat the next question as well, or okay. should we go one by one? Yeah. Do you want to answer that? Uh, yes. Yes. I th I think so. Yeah. Um, I think. I think, and that's the very important, not only intervention, but an important thing we need to understand about data center, and which is actually, for, well, I think we have the kind of impression that, you know, we are data is secure and safe and, you know, being permanently uh, stored in a specific kind of, you know, space. However, um, well, I know like a lot of data, actual data center scholar have been talking about, especially uh, Julia Velkova. I think she is talking about this, the disposability of data center, right? This kind of migrate, it's, it, data center is super migratable and it's about profit, um, especially in the uh, non-Chinese context, I would say, because I think the economic structure or the economic scheme is different there. Um, so for um, the case in um, uh, Julia Velkova, she talks about, I think it's Norway or Finland, Finland yeah, Finnish data centers. It's mostly corporational oriented, so they just care about profits. So if, if the profit doesn't take, make up, then they just abandon the, the data center. It's a very simple economic logic. But in the case of China, I think is. The, the central government really wants to, you know, imprint that idea of stability, stability um, you know, this kind of, you know, permanent memory in the construction, at least, you know, in the construction of the image of data centers um, for both the, you know, the, uh, the citizens and also the transnational corporations as well in order to, you know, um, appeal for the investment. Um, so, but I do, yes, the question is yes, and it, it will be actually pretty interesting to look at the, you know, the ways of data centers and how, you know, abandoned site or forgotten site and how this, where, where does the waste goes go and, you know, how, what kind of other space are being transformed into, for example. Um, so, thank you for the question, yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, one more question. Uh, from Mary Yi, how do regular Zimbabweans regard Chinese managers and workers? Uh, could you please repeat? Sorry. Uh, how do regular Zimbabweans regard Chinese managers and workers? Well, um, that is beyond my research uh, project, but I can see something general impression when I live there. Uh, oh, I, I think it depends on who they are, what the com group they're from. I, um, my impression is that the uh, majority um, 
uh, majority or sorry, minority uh, white uh, communities in in Zimbabwe, they cannot like view Chinese um, uh, you know complaints or forces as the comp competitors. Uh, but normal Chi no normal Zimbabweans. Um, um, I don't know. I, I guess people have very different, like, mm -hmm. uh, complex impressions. So I when I do when I do research on the perception of Chinese in, uh, in activity in Africa or in Zimbabwe, I try to like go beyond this old, uh, simplistic binary um, of uh, be beneficial partner or be exploitative or as like um, you know very uh, ne uh, very negative uh, image. So <coughs> I yeah, that's my answer. Is it then okay to open up the floor to questions from the audience assembled in this room? Yes. Thank you very much for these very really fascinating presentations and for this conversation and this the connection. Thank you, Raul, for making this really fascinating connection between media and land. And so I think and this is a question for the entire panel. So what's interesting about all of your presentations is that you move between different registers or different forms of media. So some of it is representational, some of them is environmental, some of it is embodied. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking, can you reflect in your, in your specific projects how the, the connections between these different realms of media, how you kind of move back and forth between them, how is the embodied connected to representation or, or to the environmental? Uh, if you can reflect on that in your particular projects, that would be really interesting. I mean, I deal with representational media. Um, that's the media object I'm looking at. But I will say um, I see um, land, landscape, well, also data centers as well. So if you can, you can also say it's a form of media. Um, but I just try not to, you know, say everything is media. Um, but, um, but I would say the land itself is a form of geological mediation. So it's a process of, for me, as a kind of theoretical process to think about media concepts are being uh, implicated in that process. So I would say I, you know, f going see looking at representational media, but I think the whole the project is mainly focused on the environmental media theory per se. I would say. Oh. Yeah, the work that I've done thus far in uh, my project um, does deal some with representational media in terms of like um, some of the documentaries that were produced shortly after Trinity um, and so on and again the ways in which like they're sort of informing imaginaries about um, desert landscapes that in many ways like are already there due to settler colonialism um, and also like, so, like kind of like the wider move that I'm hoping to begin to think through is like how are sort of these film strips themselves right um, informing a particular um, History in particular, um, again, I, I, uh, ideas about the value, like what lands, what bodies have value, which ones do not. Um, so yeah, so for me, it's kind of like a mix in terms of like this representational media, but then also sort of like the film strips themselves is sort of like an indexical form of media that then um, feed into ecological imaginary, something like this. Yeah, I guess, yeah. What is it? I have like a slight admission to make, which is that, you know, I don't think I, uh, I'm not like a media studies scholar. <laughs> I do mostly work in like critical infrastructure and like critical legal theory. But I find that using representational media is super helpful for me in terms of trying to like look at different ways that, you know, territory sovereignty is conceived. And it gives me like that poem by the, you know, the anonymous poet, it's just like, it's so beautiful and amazing. And I think it really speaks to something that people like feel on the ground when it comes to these bases. And so, you know, for me, I, I really, I, it, it's a powerful tool, I guess, to be able to use that, incorporate that into my work. Yeah. In a way, if I might, I, I, it's in a way, infrastructures mediate independent of media itself. So <laughs> things to that address of infrastructures like Brian Larkin said. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I would say like uh, the, uh, the project I look at is mystery media, but there are other types of like representational media. Uh, I, I interest in like the media representation because, and also these courses, because that is how 
um, how the social realities are, are, are constructed and how that shape our consciousness and perception about the world. So, yeah, I, would, I think like uh, some other um, type of uh, further projects can be done to look at some other type of uh, media representations. Other questions? <laughs> Oh, yes. Yeah, I have a question for Stephen. Um, with Christopher Nolan's film, Oppenheimer, coming out later this year in the history of the atomic bomb, kind of re entering the Zygas, what are the concerns and opportunities that you see in regards to your project? Yeah, no, I'm, that's, that's really funny that you mentioned uh, the new Oppenheimer film. Yeah, uh, one sort of just uh, anecdotal piece of evidence that comes to mind is so one of the community partners that I've been able to work with, Tina Cordova, um, who's sort of like the head organizer of the Downwinders and things like that. Um, she actually, her and some people on her team have like attempted to reach out to um, uh, Christopher Nolan's team in regards to Oppenheimer. There's, there's sort of been these moments where they have um, reached out to different artists who are doing depictions of the atomic bomb and things like this, and they've been able to sort of, um, even in like one sort of stage version of Trinity, like, like basically um, participate in like the epilogue for the uh, theatrical representation. Uh, but then for Oppenheimer, they have not heard anything back. Um, this is like, unfortunately, like isn't very surprising in the sense of like at Los Alamos um, itself, like there isn't any reference to the Downwinders. There's some recognition now of um, Chicanx, Latinx communities who, um, had bas who basically oftentimes sort of did like service work and things like that at Los Alamos, um, but uh, but nothing uh, in regards to like the downwinders themselves. So it seems unlikely <laughs> that in the um, that in the Oppenheimer film this will be something that's like addressed to any to any extent, unfortunately. Um, other questions? Am I correct in thinking there is about fourteen more minutes left for questions? Yeah. So we have. Quite some time. Um, I mean, as people, yeah, yes, sir. I have like maybe just kind of a half big question, and th thank you so much. This was such an incredible roundtable, and I feel like you know I'll probably have like a million more questions come to me at like three a.m. tomorrow when I'm like done processing <laughs> like everything you've all um, presented. But um, Tony, I was really interested in in your presentation when you were talking about this like idea of turning the base into a national park, and then in the discussion you mentioned that that was actually a way of like getting around these more like strict environmental codes for commercial real estate. Um, but in your slides, <coughs> I'm sorry if maybe you did you know speak to this, but it went kind of quickly for me. Um, like there was a nod to the fact that like this is going to be like South Korea's Central Park, that this is part of like proving the modernizing ability of the country. But I'm also wondering like to what extent a certain sort of like environmental like greenwashing discourse comes into play like in thinking about how do we like reuse and make productive in like a sustainable or like environmentally friendly way like these former sites and I'm thinking a little bit about there's this fantastic essay called Rogue Infrastructures by Alana Kim about the DMZ and like you know landmines that I'm obsessed with and that your your presentation brought to mind so I would just love to hear you talk a bit more about like these tensions between like the sort of environmental justice sustainability you know, types of projects that, that might allegedly be framed as that nevertheless maybe doesn't take, in, or does it take into account sort of the, you know, the needs of people living in the immediate surrounding space and, and these questions around like toxicity and, and the land that continue. And oh, I'm sorry, hopefully that makes sense. I'm no, sort no, of like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, what is it? I'm, I think I, I guess like me personally, I'm pretty critical of the move to build these national parks right away, mainly because, um, what that does is, yeah, what that allows is like, there's not going to be any remediation process after for the environmental waste that's there in the first place. Um, what's interesting about the park is, so Yongsan is in the middle of Seoul. And so I actually lived there for the last five years. And, you know, um, no one really talks about it. I mean, it's there, it's quite big, but you can't go in. But no one really talks about it, yet it's still in you know, the densest part of the city. Um, but that is, a, that is one where the national government has kind of taken a special like, attention to because of its kind of location. Um, and what, what is interesting is that while the national government wants to, sees it as a way of kind of like expressing state power, 
of like being like, hey, we're like a sovereign nation. We have this fully decolonized, you know, this this is a signifier for decolonized Korea. Um, the local government is actually very opposed to it. So they actually sued the national government saying that you can't build this park, even though the, they've already done the competition, they already have plans to do this. And part of the reason is because the local government wants to make money off it. <laughs> so they want to turn it into a commercial real estate area. So they're suing the national government to say, no, you need to clean up all of this to the degree where we can build commercial real estate. Um, so I think like there, like, there is greenwashing, but then there's also just like plain old like neoliberal, let's like let's make our money <laughs> also going on. And then on the other side are like citizen movements who actually have not, who actually don't necessarily propose anything yet, but they all, what they are proposing is that we need to keep doing the environmental surveys and then making sure that whatever comes out, like the U.S. can be held responsible. Um, I mean, it's a tall task. Right now, they're, a lot of people do Freedom of Information Acts to try to see what actually happened in the bases to kind of convince the national government to prod the U.S. government to do more. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of like a hit or miss. So that's been what's going on so far. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Thank you all for the fascinating uh, papers. Um, my question is also for Tony. Um, uh, I was kind of, I was, it's not necessary or anything, but I was kind of curious if you were thinking uh, comparatively with other sort of base decommission sites in other countries. I, I'm thinking of like Vieques and Puerto Rico, for example, or in Iraq. I, maybe it's not exactly about base de decommissioning, but toxicity from the use of depleted uranium and the, the armaments. and. Um, I'm just I'm interested in thinking of what maybe a comparative method could give you in terms of explanatory power, although there's, there's so many different variables on both sides, I guess, that would change. But I'm just curious if you thought about that. Um, I guess, like, for the scope of my research, I'm not thinking that broadly. But I actually do, I, I would like to read more on those things. So if you have recommendations, that would actually be really great. Um, and one of the things is, like, even in the Trans-Pacific, Japan also, Japan actually has the most U.S. military bases, and then it's Korea and Germany. And so there, you know, and obviously, you know, the Philippines also has, like, you know, the Philippines has history of U.S. military occupation. Um, Guam, the Marshall Islands, those are, you know, occupied in a different sense of just like, you know, those are just like U.S. installations completely. So there are definitely... Like, I definitely want to look at those larger patterns, but even in Korea itself, like, all of the decommissioning of bases are so different mm -hmm. that, like, comparing within different sites there is already, like, you know, A to Z. <laughs> yeah. I have, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's one more question on the, sorry, uh, on the Zoom. Uh, so from Fan Yang, uh, uh, amazing panel just wanted to see if Ting Hao Zhu is familiar with the geographer Tim Oak's work on infrastructure, uh, China made, which includes pieces on uh, Guiyan new, new area. I think it's kind of like an open question whether you have thought about it, if you are familiar with it. That sounds interesting um, and very important to read, but I have not. <laughs> so, uh, what, what, Tim Hook? Tim Hooks. Hooks. Oh, Hooks. Oh, 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 okay. Tim Thank you for the recommendation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Recommendations? Jane. Yeah. Um, can I ask you two questions? So, one is for Tim Hao. And um, I know that those data centers. Well, although they're called in the cloud, but they're really on the earth, and they're not as clean as they sound. It's a clever term to use as a cloud, white and clean, but actually it's very dirty. Um, <laughs> and um, I wonder, so by choosing place like Huiyang in southwest China, 
What are the actual environmental impacts? For instance, they will use, consume a lot of water. Um, are there any dams in the region? Is that why they're using it? Or is it connected to some use of a clean energy like wind farms and stuff like that? Because that's also the area where the Chinese government is actually developing those energy you know, projects, basically, the clean energy projects in a sense, in the Green China project. So I'm just curious, um, is that part of the reason? And if so, um, how did it connect it to the establishment of the data center and stuff like that? And also for in Yi, I'm curious, so you, you're basically looking at the um, African media representation of the tensions there. Um, how about uh, the, the media reports within China? Are there any other voices that you were been observing in the media or just among you know entrepreneurs who wanted to go to Africa and they're trying to see if there are some uh, risks, potential risks involved in this project? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, so yes, um, well, I'm not particularly sure like which kind, of, like which dam is being built or you know which infrastructural project are being built there, um, which I need to um, do more research on um, during this summer. But the reason why the central government want to build that city, uh, build a so-called you know big data city over there is because of one, the cheap, uh, the cheap electricity price and the cheap labor price. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the two key um, important, uh, you know, um, cost uh, financial reasons. And also um, because it's pre predominantly a car's uh, landscape. So the um, average um, temperature of, of the area is, uh, is pretty mild, which is um, they conceive it as a kind of natural air, condition, air conditioning, which is essential to um, data centers infrastructure. Um, so that's the reason why, oh, um, why the Tencent build that you know, infrastructure. Uh, you know, I show that photo with you know, different holes in there, and that's because they want it to cool down, and they don't uh, need to, you know, pay a lot of electricity fee, a cost. You know. yeah. um, thank you for the question. Um, so in China, the media reports, um, as you know, the uh, media ecology in China, uh, I, I would say like my observation is the majority of the reports is aligned with the uh, state propaganda or the ideology, which kind of put, uh, portrays that the Chinese uh, and uh, Chinese activities in Zimba uh, in Africa or the relations between Africa and China is more like friendship and a collaborative. Uh, that is the framework the, um, the Chinese media or Chinese uh, government tries to use um, when when it comes to like reporting about uh, the relations. Um, but I do also like uh, uh, observe that there's some other voices to try to um, uh, how to say uh, try to like ask the government to develop some international uh, overseas laws uh, or like regulations to hold the overseas transnational companies into account in terms of environment concerns. Because as you know, China uh, is now is in this ecological modernization. Um, that is like leading policy in the, in the, in the nation's development um, uh, path. So, but, uh, but uh, like as, uh, as we, um, but uh, I think that there's a failure to translate this ecological modernization path, which balanced the uh, economic growth and uh, and also environment concerns into the uh, their transnational projects in mm -hmm. Africa. So yeah, so our voices try to um, uh, try to like construct some regulate regulative laws to hold those um, overseas projects in account. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we are inching to two p.m. So. Maybe we should, we can take one more question if there is any. On then, should we? There is? No. No. Okay, so, so please join me in thanking our fabulous. <laughs>